Welcome, I'm Carol Stern. I'm here at the School of Science and Math with uh, Maria Hernandez, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, this is the fifth session that we're doing on uh, Common Core State Standards, and I'm just going to turn it over to Maria. If you have any questions or comments, um, I have a chat window open, and I'm sharing those comments with Maria. So again, welcome. I'm Maria Hernandez. It's great to have you guys with us here um, this afternoon. In this particular session, um, what I'd like to do is to talk a little bit about um, a particular hands-on problem that I found um, that folks like because it's, it's adaptable in terms of using it across grade levels and courses. And so we'll consider a specific problem um, that I think and uh, we can tackle even in the eighth grade math classroom or maybe even in seventh grade in terms of different kinds of approaches and then we'll kind of um, also talk about it in terms of higher level math courses in algebra 2 or pre-calculus and it can even be extended to a calculus application. So um, I think I'm hoping that it'll be a problem that you find useful and something that um, you can do in your classrooms to help students get their head, heads around um, the idea of building a function or building a model using a function. So um, we're going to share lots of materials with you. I created a pretty in-depth lesson plan that has um, the, the lesson according to these different levels. I kind of split it apart. So the handout that you got from Carol yesterday um, is a student handout that will certainly be available. I'll give you the website at the end of this session. It will be available on that um, website. And take the shared content. So um, I'll give you um, the handout that's a student handout that again is based on different levels. It will have this PowerPoint on it, so you don't have to worry about taking notes from the PowerPoint. It will have the in-depth um, lesson plan so that it has uh, possible solutions in there. And then also I have a geometry sketchpad file that I didn't create, but when I did this problem in um, in a hands-on session, one of the participants in there, um, a woman named Greta Mills from New Hampshire, created a geometry sketchpad file that goes along with the particular um, problem that I think you will find useful in terms of visualizing the problem. So let's get started with the problem. So here's the problem. Um, if you're going to do this with your students, I recommend that you um, you give give each group uh, a pair uh, a a wire, so I've just got a wire here, let me kind of hold this up against the background because I don't know if you can see it very well. I have just a wire here that um, I went over to like Home Depot or Lowe's or someplace and just asked them to cut um, a long piece of wire for me and then I took it home and cut it into different size lengths. But so the problem is set up in this way that's kind of more open-ended. It says you have a piece of plastic covered electrical wire of length L, so L isn't specified. And what we'd like for you to do is to cut the wire into two pieces, one of which you'll uh, form into a square and the other into a circle. And our objective for the first part of the problem is to think about doing this in such a way so that the sum of the two figures, areas, I'm sorry, the sum of the areas of the two figures is as small as possible. So um, again, what I'd like to do is think about this problem in different ways um, if you take the wire and you give each group a different length, this becomes um, kind of a more, I think, a more advanced problem. If you decide instead that we're all going to get, each group is going to get a wire of length 24 inches, then we can be more specific and approach the problem form from a more elementary level, if you will, in terms of the numerical approach. So I'm going I'm to suppose that we all have the same length of wire and that it's 24 inches long. Um, so like I said, I just go over to, uh, you know, a Home Depot or a Lowe's or someplace like that and ask folks to cut me a, a long piece of wire and this is about 20 cents a foot, I think. And sometimes they even have a scrap table where you can get scraps of wire for very inexpensive. And if you tell them you're a math teacher, a lot of times they'll cut you a deal because they like math teachers and they think it's cool that you're using wire in your math class. So anyway, we're going to do the problem from that approach that we all have the same length of wire. And what we'd like to do as we work through the problem is to think about how your students will approach the problem, again, based on maybe different classes, different levels, um, what kind of prior knowledge they'll need. And what I found for this particular problem, when I kind of throw the problem out, it's a pretty open-ended problem, but the, um, 
students sometimes don't know where to start. So we'll think about kind of getting our hands on the problem in a sense and helping students figure out how to push forward. And then if they get stuck along the way, how to push forward and to, I think, um, really encourage them to share their own ideas that um, this is a nice problem because of that. If they just start writing down some of the things that they know, that prior knowledge, they write down some formulas for say the area of the square, the area of the circle, or circumference and perimeter, those ideas that at least there's some place they can start. And then if you are doing this where you're going to let students work with their um, group members and use different approaches to the problem, then how might you think about organizing or sequencing um, what students share in that, that process in terms of their approach to the problem? So, Again, I'm trying to think about it with lots of different hats on, but if we think about everybody having the same length of wire, um, then I think it'll simplify our approach for this webinar, and then we'll talk a little bit about extensions of the problem for other classes. Okay, so let's think about the, just the various solution methods. So uh, this is where, as audience participation, I encourage you to think about how your students would approach this problem, how they might get their hands on it, and just type in the chat box, Carol's watching the chat box for me, um, and let me know what you're thinking about in terms of if you gave this student this problem to your students and they knew that the wire was 24 inches long, what would they do to try to get started on this problem? So I'm going to wait a minute. I'm going to do that waiting time thing so I can get you guys to chat in the chat window there, just type a suggestion of what your students might do to approach this problem. They would cut it in half. So Terry says that some of them would be brave. They'd take their wire cutters and just cut it in half. So why, why would you say that, Terry? That's interesting. I've gotten that answer before. They always do. Okay, so they're kind of taking middle of the road then. So they're just saying, well, let's just cut it in half and see what happens, which is, it's an okay approach. We're not actually going to cut it. What, what we might do is we might encourage them to let's suppose that we did cut it in half. Let's calculate the area of the two figures and see what happens. Does somebody else have another suggestion besides this going straight for the halves? Start with the area, just a circle, and just a square from the 24 inch piece. Great, so that's really nice. I thank you for that comment. So what we've done then is consider the two extremes. If I only make a circle out of my wire, what will the area of that circle be? If I only make a square, what will the area of that square be? And now if we put it together with Terry's suggestion, we'll have actually three pieces of information because what if we cut it in half and made the circle and the square, what would the combined areas be? So in a sense, what we're trying to do here with your suggestions is we're building some, um, actually some intuition in a sense, what's going on with these different kinds of possibilities. So I'm gonna take that, I'm gonna say, if we have a, a level of student that um, maybe isn't familiar with functions, they might not go to the functions, they might do what, exactly what you guys are talking about, and that is actually to think about some specific cases. And one way you could kind of organize those specific cases is to say, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide the students up in pairs and assign each pair of students a specific length to use for, say, the perimeter of the square. That's arbitrary. I just decided to do it that way. And then have them calculate the combined areas of the figures. So if you do that and you have, say, 24 kids, then you should get 12 data points in a sense. We're going to build a table, um, a data set, and with that, because of the way I've set up the, um, the measurements, I could have said, for example, let's suppose we only make a square, like someone suggested, and then what if we made a square with only two inches of the wire, and then what if we made a square with four inches of the wire, six, etc. So if we do that, then we can get a nice data set. So let me show you the table that I have on the next slide where I actually calculated that. And this, to be honest with you, even calculating these, these actual values can be powerful for the students because they have to think about, if I only use two inches for the square, then how big is the side? 
if I'm going to use the perimeter as two inches, then each side will be half an inch, right? And they can calculate the area of their square. And then how big is the other piece with the rest of it is, if this is two inches and the whole thing's 24, I've got 22 inches left. But that's going to be the circumference of my circle. So if I've got the circumference of the circle and I'm looking for the area of the circle, what I'll need to do is take the circumference, which is 22 inches, and figure out what the radius of my circle is. So they're going to use that circumference formula to figure out the radius. And then once they have the radius of the circle, they can calculate the area of their circle. So just kind of collecting that data as um, a class and have them write those points on the board can be a nice, just a nice quick way, maybe not so quick, but um, a nice kind of hands-on way where they actually get to calculate some values. Now, um, when the, actually the extreme pieces in terms of only making a circle and only making a square, that we'd like to tell the kids that is a possibility that you don't have to cut the wire because that, that is one of the questions that comes up. Okay, so here's my table, and I have a handout with, like I said, with this numerical approach. So one of the things we could do is we could take this data set and put it in our calculators. I'm not going to do that right now because I'd like to be able to talk about some of the other solutions. But if we put that in our calculators, then we should get a nice graph. There you go. There's a graph of that data set. So once they, the kids have this data set, which will take a little while to put it all together, we get the kids to cal make their calculation, put it up on the board. If the kids are familiar with putting in the data into the stat list editor in their calculators, they could type in the um, independent variable, that is L1, the way I've got it graphed here, is going to be that X, which is, remember, the piece of wire that I'll use as the perimeter of the square. And then along the vertical axis, you can ask them, what does that Y value mean? And hopefully they'll understand because we built the table that the Y value is actually the area or the combined areas of the two figures. So what would your students do at this point if we had this on the board and we said, now remember what we're trying to do. We're trying to create these figures so that the combined area, the combined area is minimum, the minimum value. Suggestions about what your kids might do at this point. And again, it might depend on what courses you teach. Somebody says quad reg. Yeah, that's one of the things I'd had on the table too. So they might just push the quadratic regression button. Other suggestions? So if you think about this, if they've just got the data set, there's a suggestion about using the second calc minimum, which is certainly a, um, an option on the calculator. But I'd like for you to think about if you only have a um, scatter plot on, you don't actually have a function. I'm just going to look real quick, make sure this is what is true. I'm going to turn a scatter plot on just on my own calculator here because I happen to have it here in my hand. And I'm going to see if that second calc feature is something that actually works if you only have a stat plot on. Minimum. Yeah, if I only have a stat plot on and I try to choose that, nothing happens. So that second calc minimum won't work if you've only got a data set. If you're going to hit the quad reg button, like the suggestion that we got, we'll actually have some type of a model. We'll have this quadratic model because it looks like a quadratic function would make sense. We can also talk to the kids about why that might make sense if the independent variable is a linear dimension. And if they think about what's on the vertical axis, that's the area. So it would make sense that this would be quadratic in that linear dimension because its area is quadratic, right? You multiply. Here's another suggestion. My, my students might choose the power regression, so a different power if they're not convinced that it's quadratic. Okay. And I have another chat comment that they would choose the lowest point. Yeah, there you go. So we have this data set. We can just look across that data set even just look at across these numbers and say, oh, yeah, here we go. We're minimized here. Let me move my chat window out of the way so I can see. The minimum value here is 20.29. And what we're hoping is that they might say, well, that's what my teacher gave. My teacher gave me these specific X values. How do I know that there's not a value that's in between these, maybe even um, a portion of an inch? 
that might actually minimize the area. And then I've got a comment here they might just guess from the visual. So these are all good comments. And what we'd like to do is to kind of lead them, to, again, depending on the level of the student, to think about things that go beyond just the particular data set because I just chose these increments of two because I thought it would make sense to, um, to have 12 data points depending on the number of students I have. So that's those suggestions that you guys gave me I actually have here. What we have here is uh, possible transformations of functions. Nobody suggested that, but you could say, if you think the function is quadratic, could you take our basic parent function of x squared, if you're doing this with the Algebra 2 students, you could say, what if I take my parent function x squared and try to use transformations of functions to push it over to the right and up and then also try to think about expanding it in the right way so that we have either a horizontal um, stretch or a vertical compression. So I think that in itself could be kind of an interesting um, exercise for the students if that's what your goal was for this particular lesson. Um, I'm not going to go go from that standpoint because I want to think about it in terms of, um, of other kinds of approaches, but that certainly is a, a reasonable thing to do if you were doing this with transformations of function. And if you do that, you might think about, well, how will I know how far right to shift it and how far up to shift it if I don't really know what the vertex is? That's why I'm not knocked out about that approach, because our, our objective is to find the vertex if you believe that this is quadratic. So what I'd like to do is take the other suggestion that we got and that is use a quadratic regression. So if you hit the quad reg key and your students are familiar with that, then this is what the calculator produced for me when I hit the quadra quadratic regression. So again, depending on your on your um, goal for the for the lesson, this could be enough. You could say, well, I just want them to understand that it's a quadratic. Use the machine to get a quadratic regression, but you can still ask some interesting questions here. You can type this in your calculator, and then you can use the minimum key. You could also say, well, let's just try to make sense of some of these values in here. For example, this 45.85, you could ask the students, what does that 45.85 mean in the context of the problem? So again, there, I think there are different approaches, and, and depending on your goals for the lesson, you can let your kids go in those directions. So um, I'm going to keep moving, because what I'd really like to do is think about it from a higher level and say, what if we actually want to build a function. But I will say that if you have um, students at these other levels that we've been talking about, you could take it from here and still finish the problem, right? You could still minimize this function, hit the minimum key, and figure out what the x value is. And then again, there's still lots of interpretation to, to be done because you have to say, well, what does the x represent? Remember for us, you have to keep reminding the students that, x it's important to define our variables. X is the length of the wire that I'm going to use for the square. So once they know that perimeter of the square, they can go ahead and cut the wire. So you bring your wire cut, wire cutters in, have them cut it, and then go ahead and make the figures, the two figures. When they do that, they're going to see a beautiful geometric relationship that I'm not going to talk about just yet. But even at this particular point, this geometric relationship comes out. And it's true that the geometric relationship will hold no matter what the length of your wire is. So this is one approach that we chose to have everybody have the same length of wire because it lends itself to this approach where we create a data set. If instead you gave each group a different length of wire and say you were going to build your function in a different way, then we wouldn't build the data set. It wouldn't make sense to build a data set in that, right, that way but instead we would need a function. So it actually kind of um, gives the students some, some motivation to seek a more complicated, or not maybe not complicated, but a more um, sophisticated solution method. So if you give everybody a different length of wire, then we can't really create this data set per se, but instead let's think about it from a function modeling approach. So if I go back to thinking about building a function, I'm, I've drawn a picture here, and again, this is um, arbitrary the way I've decided to, to state this specifically. You might not do this depending on um, the level of students. You might just let kids start writing down formulas for the area of a circle and the area of a square 
and then relate it to the perimeters here that we're talking about. So this is just one approach. If I let X be the piece of wire that I'm going to use for the square, just kind of going back to the other problem, then the, the rest of the wire is going to be used for the circumference of the circle. So I can find the area of the square because the perimeter is X, so I'm going to take X and divide it by 4 and then square that amount. That's, that'll be the area that is the contribution from the square. And then the circumference of the circle is the rest of it, so it's 24 minus x. And the area of the circle, well, we know the area of the circle is pi r squared, but I need to be able to get r in terms of x. So if I go back to the idea that I know what the circumference is, the circumference is 2 pi r in general. I know that's equal to 24 minus x, and I can solve that for r in terms of x. So we've got the makings of a function now, a function that will be representing the combined area of the two figures, and that function is our model. So we're going to say area is um, uh, x over 4 quantity squared plus pi times the quantity 24 minus x over 2 pi squared. Now, again, that's not the only way to do this. If you did this in a more open-ended way, then you would let kids get to this point via their route. So um, if instead they let x be the piece that they use for the circumference of the circle, this, of course, this wouldn't make sense. It's a different function. Or if in, I've seen kids, for example, write down something like um, the area of a square is s squared and the area of the circle is pi r squared, and then go from there thinking about which of those pieces would be useful in terms of perimeters and the circumference of these two figures. So this is just one particular idea. If you give kids wires that are different lengths, then this 24 up here will change to whatever the length of their wire is. And this will be more powerful, I think, if you do give kids different lengths of wire because they'll, they can see that this function is something that's uniform. And what changes about it is this parameter, this 24. So if you, if you look at that, um, depending on what your students are used to doing, there could be some, um, they could feel like they really want to simplify this expression. I use the word simplify almost in quotes because I think the expression or the function is fine just the way it is. They can type it in their calculator. They got to be careful with parentheses, granted. But in terms of expanding this binomial out, you don't really need to expand that binomial out if what you're going to do is take this function and use the minimum key on your calculator. So depending on, again, where your students are and how comfortable they are with um, typing this particular expression in, then you could maybe you could clean up the denominator here. This would be 4 pi squared, and I could um, divide out the pi's. But you know, there's no reason to expand that binomial. Right now, there's no reason to do that if we're going to just type it in our calculator and find the minimum. So since I asked you guys to bring your calculators along, let's do that. I'm going to go to my emulator, and I'm just going to type this function in. I don't have the data set typed in here, but we'll just type that function in and then find the minimum. So I've got x divided by 4, and if you're playing along with me, I, ask, yeah, I invite you to type it in as well. And this is where we're going to be careful with parentheses. I'm going to go ahead and suppose that I've cleaned it up. So I'm going to just go right here on here and make sure I don't do it incorrectly. I have 24 minus x quantity squared in the numerator, and I'd have 4 pi in the denominator. And that's really just to avoid trouble with parentheses. So I'm going to have 24 minus x divided by or pi, I need to square it, and these parentheses I do need, and I'll go back and square it. Okay. So I'm going to scooch back here for this quantity by inserting the square, okay? And if you'll notice that the, it's trying to graph for me, let's see, make sure I got this right here. Okay, so now if I hit window, I want to think about a good window because, let me get rid of that, 
I want to think about a good window because it's important for the student to think about the domain of this function. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. But in general, remember that x is the length of the wire that I'm going to use to make the um, square. So how small can x be and how big can x be? Well, normally the domain of a quadratic function is all real numbers, but because we have this context, the domain becomes very specific. And it, again, it can be a very interesting conversation for students. A lot of times the kids want to hit the magic zoom button, so they'll hit the zoom fit or whatever. And I really try to encourage them not to do that, to instead make sense of the context. So let's go ahead and um, change the window here. And I'm going to change the x min to 0. And if I used a wire of length 24 inches, the maximum x value would be 24. And I'll make the scale 2. So if you all have comments or questions as we're working along, please holler. What I'd like to do now is to use the um, table feature on my calculator to think about a good y window, because it's not always obvious to students what the y window will be. Now, because if you did it with the 24 inches, because we generated a list of values, you could say, well, we can look at our data set, if you're going to use this model on top of your data, and say, I can certainly use the data set to come up with a good y window. But I also like to use the table feature on the calculator. So I'm going to hit second window. And I'm going to say, suppose I start at 0 and I jump by 2. So if I go too fast on the calculator, let me know. I can slow down. And then if I hit second graph, which is table, then I can see those values, actually, that we collected. There you go. But if you didn't do it from a data perspective where each of us had our own length of wire, then this will help students find a good window. So uh, somehow I've gotten crazy and gone all the way to 60. 60 doesn't make sense in the context of the problem, but I can kind of use this to set my window for the y value. So this 0 to 130 is what was in there already. That seems like a reasonable uh, window. The y max is bigger than we need. But now if I hit graph, you can see the graph that's already in the middle of my screen. It kind of gave it away. So if you think about this, this is really the window in context. If I hit trace now, and I say, well, let me see what the value of this function is. We'll hit second trace. And let's just plug in a value at 0. Then you can say the combined areas will be 45.83. That area, that total area is 45.83 inches squared. You can ask the kids what that is what the units are there, and then we could use the second calc feature and choose minimum. And when you do that, it's asking for a left bound. So I'm just making sure that I'm to the left of the minimum. I'll hit enter. And then it's asking me for a right bound. So I'm going to scroll to the right until I'm to the right of the minimum. Sorry, this is, emulator's kind of slow. So until I get to the right of the minimum, which looks like I'm going up now, I'll hit enter there. And then, oh, I think it's trying to catch up with my keystrokes. There we go. <laughs> nope. So I have a comment here. Yep. If you set the domain in window, then press zoom zero, it will set the range and the kids can go back and fix the y min and y max as needed so it makes sense for the problem. Yep, that's right. So a lot of, the zoom fit, again, I'm not crazy about using the zoom, but they really like zoom fit. So the, the advantage of that, that is that at least they have to think about the domain of the function, and then they can tweak it after they get some kind of a sense um, for those values. But also I like to look, have them look at the table of values as well because the table's always there and you know what's happening when you look at the table. But my kids do like Zoom Fit. So I'm going to go ahead and hit enter here for the guess. And there you go. It calculated um, that the length that I should use for my perimeter of my square is 13, about 13.4 and that the total area combined is 20.16.
So if you were gonna if you were gonna stop here, I would think that it would be very important for the kids to sketch a graph of the function, to label the axes with words and units and numbers, and then to label this minimum value and write a sentence that explains what's gonna happen in terms of this point that I see on the graph. They should be able to say, okay, now I'm ready to cut my wire. I'm gonna measure about 13 and a half or so inches for the um, perimeter of the square and then the rest of it is going to be my circle, and then they can go ahead and make their two figures. And again, if you have different groups with different lengths of wires, of course their answers are going to be different. And actually, um, on the lesson plan, the other thing I just thought about is if you do want to use this as a writing assignment um, where they actually build a function, I've provided a list of expectations. If you wanted to do kind of a, like a uh, just a short project or a writing assignment for the kids, a list of expectations that you might want them to include in a, in a report, and then also a sample rubric. Um, that I think it's important for students to have the opportunity to write about mathematics and not just think about math as a, a list of formulas and facts, but instead of a, a tool for solving a real world problem. So when they have to think about standing back and looking at their process, um, being able to put all that stuff together and write you a short report, maybe together with a partner, so that they have somebody to bounce their ideas off of can be a very, um, I think, a powerful thing. So at this point, then you be ready for, to let the kids cut their wires. So when they cut their wires, and again, if everybody has a different length, this can be very powerful because if you make the two figures, one thing that's very interesting that happens in this problem is that when you're minimizing the sum of the areas of the two figures, no matter what the length of your wire is, you will always get this beautiful geometric relationship. I hate to ruin it for you, but I'm going to show you up here. <laughs> and it will be such that the circle will be inscribed in the square. So some folks might think, well, I know that the circle will max, if I just make a circle, it will maximize the area. Some people might say, well, that, that might mean that if I just make a square, it will minimize the area, but that's not the case. Instead, you get this beautiful geometric relationship. So I'm showing you a pretty big one here. I even have like a really tiny one here because I gave some other kids a smaller wire. And if you get all of the kids to hold up their circle in their square and show that the circle is inscribed in the square, it's a pretty powerful notion. So I just want to show you that because I think it's great for the kids. Okay. So let's get back to the PowerPoint. Are there questions or comments here for what we've done so far? So we have our model, and then I want to think about um, minimizing the area. So we've already done that. We've minimized it. And also, I also want to note, notice that, remember when we had just the data set, we kind of made some, um, just some kind of prediction that it would be a quadratic. It kind of looks like a parabola. And then somebody said, well, you know, they might hit some other um, regression button. If they build the model themselves, there's no doubt that this is a quadratic. And I got a comment that their, your kids would love this. That's great. Thank you for that comment. I, I think it's very powerful. I found it both with teachers and with students to be kind of a classic optimization problem. You'll see it a lot of times in calculus books. It's been around forever. But until I actually built, um, actually cut the wire, I didn't see this beautiful geometric relationship. So um, I think it's great because of that, too. It's also got a lot of nice extensions that we'll talk about. So the kids can see that this is a quadratic function. We'll talk about, the, you could talk about the fact that you know that this opens up, it's a parabola that opens up because the leading coefficient, now remember I said you wouldn't really want to multiply all this out, but hopefully they would be able to see that this coefficient of course is positive because it's a quarter squared. And the coefficient of the quadratic term here as well should be positive because I'm squaring it out. So it should be a parabola that opens up. And you're convinced that it really is a parabola. Now, if you think about it from an algebraic standpoint, if your students are familiar with quadratics, they probably know how to find the vertex of the parabola. Maybe they've figured out the formula. Maybe, they've, um, maybe you've talked about it in other ways. But it, if you were brave enough to let your students um, quote unquote simplify this algebraically, that is multiply out all the terms so that you can identify the coefficient of the quadratic term, the linear term, and the constant term. Actually, you don't need the constant term. 
just the quadratic and the linear term, you could have them identify the vertex of the parabola without hitting the magic button. And, and then again, it gives them some power because this 24 here will be replaced by whatever the length of their wire is. And so everybody will be able to find the vertex of their parabola, no matter what this, this parameter, in a sense, is. Okay. Uh, oops, sorry. Let's uh, talk a little bit about the, um, sorry, the domain. So we talked a little bit about what does X represent. So we have the picture there. And again, that was arbitrary the way I set it up. If you let your kids just dive in, that won't be um, consistent throughout the entire class. But we talked about how small x could be and how big x could be. And that idea of the domain having some kind of physical property, that is that the kids are holding the domain in their hand when, they, when you give them the wire. Because what they're thinking about is if x is as small as possible, and that is you only make a circle, that is it's zero, then I've got that particular instance. If x is as large as possible, then I've only made a square, and they can see that X is whatever the length of the wire is. So that's very, I think, very powerful. And the other thing is that when you think about it from a, a higher level of mathematics, what we're doing here is we're minimizing a function on a closed interval. So there is, there's a guarantee that the function, because it's a continuous function, will have a minimum and it will have a maximum on that closed interval. So the idea of minimizing the function, of course, we've done that because we have the parabola and we're trying to find the vertex. But the idea of maximizing the function becomes a little bit, I guess, um, kind of trickier. Because if I just gave you a parabola and I said, what's the maximum of the parabola? Well, if you're not considering it over a closed interval, then you don't really, there is no maximum. The parabola opens up, it goes on forever and ever, so the maximum is infinity. But because I'm concerned about it over a closed interval, then I really do have a maximum. And if I look at the graph, so that is, if we think about those extremes, what do those extreme values yield and how they relate to the graph? Let's look at the graph. There's my function, and there's my graph. And if I look at the graph, if I ask my kids, what if x is 0? Well, this part is 0. And then I only get the circle. Well, that's what happens over here. That's this point here. And you can see that on this closed and bounded interval, this function does have a maximum, and it occurs at this leftmost endpoint. So it's a kind of a precursor to the extreme value theorem, which is an important theorem in calculus. So if you think about maximizing the area, we would only make a circle. And then if we make x be the largest it can be, that is over here on this right-hand endpoint, that would mean that x is 24 and this piece would go away and we'd only have a square. So I think, it, again, it's got a lot of nice representations here. I've got the geometric representation here. I've got the function. We have a numerical approach, too, so we could put that up there, too, and then we have this graphical approach. So all those different representations are, are nice to have together, so hopefully the kids can make connections across those. The geometer sketchpad file that I've made available to you, um, like I said, was created by Greta Mills. She was a participant in one of my workshops a couple years ago, and um, she created this great uh, geometer sketchpad file, and she said it was fine if I shared it. So I'm going to click on this and open it. So if you have GeoSketchpad, um, you, can, you should be able to open this file, let us know if something goes wrong and you can't open it. But what she's got here is across the top here, she's got the wire. And she's got something here where I can change mm -hmm. the length that I use. She looks like she set it up so that this is a square. So you see that if I go all the way to this left-hand endpoint, the square is nothing and the circle is the only thing I make. And then she's also got this green function across here. That's the combined area function. And if I go all the way to the right, you can see that I use the entire wire to make the square. I don't know what she used for her entire length of the wire here. And if you just want to ask the kids to kind of scroll until they're trying to minimize this, this value right here, this 10.52, we're keeping our eye on that. And you ask the kids to holler when we get there. Oh, looks 
looks like we're somewhere in here. 10.48. Oh, so maybe for this one, I've got 10, the sum of the areas is 10.48. And if you do this, she has minimized the sum, so actually we've already done that by hand. But if you click this button where she has watch with an exclamation point on it, she shows you that the circle is inscribed in the square. So this is a really nice, I think, visual tool for the kids. Um, and then you're welcome to use that. So that's available for you. Are there any questions or comments so far? So again, I invite you just to type in the in the chat box um, if you have any comments or questions. So again, some of the things that I've already mentioned um, that I why I think this this problem is so powerful is that the students get to create create their own mathematical models. And again, I've been prescriptive a little bit about which way we created the model, but I don't always do that with my students depending on. Um, what level they're at. I just let them kind of dive in and try to help them with their own ideas and then kind of get to the idea of um, thinking about different ways to approach the problem. If you let kids approach it in their own way, then they can compare their models and think about, well, what do I want to do with this model and which is the easier one to work with? So I have a question. Could you show the equation again? But I also wanted to comment, you're going to give them this the presentation, right? Yes, you will have the um, PowerPoint and all the um, other files. So I'll go back to this equation here. Is that the equation you wanted? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> there was a, a comment about not expanding the polynomial. Because, yeah, because it depends on what you want to do with the mathematics. You know, if you're at a point where we're, we're building the function and trying to make sense of the function, there's no reason to expand it. In fact, if you expand it, you might lose some information that, that kind of hits you over the head here. You're looking at this and you say, tell the kids, what if x is 24? They should be able to say, wow, if x is 24, that numerator is zero, which means I don't have a circle. If you put, you know, if you write over this, this is the part that contributed by the circle, and this is the part that's contributed by the square. Similarly, if x is zero, what's going to happen? If I squared all of this out and combined like terms, you, you'd lose some information. And I think that's kind of a powerful notion, too, because, um, you know, we do spend a good bit of time getting students to be um, comfortable with those algebraic um, processes, but we also want to be able to say, if you're using it to do a real-world problem, you don't necessarily have to do that as an exercise. Um, if you think about this from a calculus perspective, if you want to extend it to calculus, this 24 here would be a parameter. We could call it L. That's why I introduced the problem, um, not specifically in terms of a number there. And if you do this in terms of the parameter, then, of course, we still get this function, quadratic function, with a parameter in it. And the kids have to make sense of the fact that X is the variable and L is fixed. L is L is governed by the piece of wire that I hand you. So when you try to think about minimizing this function on the closed and bounded intervals, if you're a calculus student, you might take the first derivative and set it equal to zero, and then you'll get some x value that will be, in this particular case, the perimeter of the square. And then when they figure out what the rest of it's going to be in terms of the circle, it might not be obvious that the geometric relationship that I showed you is there unless they actually solve for the length of the side of the square and the length of the uh, or the radius of the circle. Because then what they'll see is that powerful idea that the length of the side of the square should be two times the radius of the circle. So that's kind of nice. Also, even if you didn't do it in terms of calculus, but in terms of pre-cal, if you wanted to find the vertex of that parabola, you can still do it in terms of either, um, you know, thinking about minus b over 2a or using the calculator. And they can still see algebraically that if they figure out the radius of the circle and the length of the side of the square, the radius should be half that, that length. I have a comment. Mm -hmm. um, is this a performance task that you would recommend using in a remediation type class? Uh, I don't think so. I think that if you were going to do this, you 
you would probably want to think about it as some kind of a, a collective group effort if you were, especially if you were thinking about in terms of remediation, what you might be thinking about is can my kids actually approach this open-ended question and get their hands on it in some way. So that idea of being more specific and saying each pair of students, you do this task um, just to be able to find the combined areas and then let's put all that information together. So it would be more kind of a, a culminating experience in a sense instead of a specific um, can you do this one particular task, one, uh, another particular task because I think that um, you know, again, if you're trying to lead kids in one particular direction, then it would be kind of, I'm doing a piece of an important big project as opposed to I'm just doing one specific thing and that's all you're testing is that one specific thing. It's kind of, can I move forward and get my hands on this? And then after we collect the data together, what do I do with that? So I think of it as more kind of an open-ended kind of a, almost a lab um, activity in a sense. So let's keep going here just to, um, to think again about if we're going to reflect on the problem. Um, we've talked a lot about the domain and making, con making um, sense of the pieces of information in the context of the problem and then of course the extreme cases such as the physical constraints. When I talk about which form might be easier to use, because I was specific in my approach, that might not make a lot of sense here, but if you did leave it as a more open-ended um, task where you let kids build their own models, then it, it, that might that, that will make more sense because if you have a student that set up the problem in a different way, um, then they can compare their final model with somebody else's and say, I know I like your model better, let's go with that one. Okay. More things that are powerful about the problem, of course, that beautiful geometric relationship that emerged from the specific problem that I had no idea was I did this problem for 20 years before I saw that, <laughs> that relationship and that it can, like I've mentioned, it can be extended to calculus um, and show kids the power of parameters. Um, another thing I think that is um, interesting in terms of an extension is that you could ask the kids, what if instead of making a circle and a square, if I made a circle and an equilateral triangle? So if you think about it from that perspective, to a escape out of here. I think I'll probably have to escape. I have a comment here. Mm -hmm. um, how about having some students work it numerically, graphically, while others work it algebraically? Yeah, that would be great. So again, depending on kind of differentiated instruction where your kids are, you might say, yes, you really want to get your hands on it. You guys do the numerical way, and then we can compare our model to our data. That'd be that'd be very powerful, I think, for students. And then that goes back to the idea of if you're going to let, if you're going to have kids do it in um, those different types of approaches, if you're going to share out, you're going to actually have kids come up to the board and share what they've done, or if you have a document camera, show show what they've done. Then you, as the leader of the conversation, you can think about how um, you would kind of you know layer those approaches so you might have the numerical folks come up first and sh share their data set and then you'd have the function folks come up next and put it all together there's also a comment here that says oh, that you like sketchpad yeah you you can do this with sketchpad and i have not um i don't have a lot of experience with geogebra but i've been told by folks that use geogebra which is kind of a free it, it is free but it's a uh, comparable i guess to geometry sketchpad is that it wouldn't be too difficult to create it in, in GeoGebra. So if somebody out there feels um, courageous and wants to try uh, creating something like that with GeoGebra, please, please send me an email and um, share it with the rest of us and I'll put it up there on the website and give you a byline and everything because that would be great because yeah, then you don't have to buy program GeoGebra for free. So I just wanted to escape out of here just real quick. We have a little bit of time left. I just want to think about it in terms of, let's create just a real quick one note. Page here. If we think about it in terms of making a square, now we we're going to do a triangle. Let's do an equilateral triangle and a circle here. 
Then if I let x be the perimeter of the triangle and then say 24 minus x be the circle, then what I need for kids to understand is to how to find this total area here, you'd need the area of the triangle plus the area of the circle. And again, if you were doing it from a numerical perspective, depending on where your students are, they would need to be able to think about finding the area of this triangle knowing that this, each of these side lengths is x over 3. So they need to be able to find the area of that triangle using one half the base times the height, where the height, of course, has to, has to be calculated in terms of the side length. So this would be a nice kind of twist if you have, you know, kids that are pushing forward and you need something that stretches them a little bit differently, then you could certainly um, do the problem in terms of the circle and the triangle. Uh, the other beautiful thing that is uh, so powerful about this problem is that if you do it with an equilateral triangle and a circle, I have a model here, I'll put it in front of my um, paper here so you can see it, is that the circle will be inscribed in the triangle as well. And in fact, if you make any other polygon and a circle, this relationship will hold. So, again, I'm hoping to whet your appetite and have you explore it in lots of different levels. Um, I haven't looked at, say, for example, looking at a square and a triangle, what kinds of relationship happen. But if you do a circle and any other polygon, then you're going to have the circle inscribed in the polygon. So let's go back to the PowerPoint. So in terms of the um, Common Core state standards, um, content standards, we're certainly using modeling. I mean, I didn't put modeling on here because the whole it's really all under the umbrella of modeling. But if you're, you're thinking about writing the function that describes the relationship between two quantities and combining standard functions, if you use transformations of functions, like I mentioned before, then of course you'd be thinking about taking a data set and trying to manipulate x squared in terms of the transformations, um, horizontal shifts, vertical shifts, compressions, et cetera, to fit that, that um, data set. And then for geometry, there's lots of nice geometry properties in here too. And then like I said, of course, for modeling, um, it hits a lot of the content standards. If you think about the, um, sorry, these are not the content standards, this, these are the practices. This is the mathematical practices. Um, the kids have to make sense of the problems and oftentimes persevere. That perseverance is really hard. They see something that they don't know where to start. And so it's, it's kind of, you know, our, relation, our, our responsibility to kind of get them to start somewhere. Write down what formulas you know. Let's do a specific example. Some of you said, well, let's suppose we just cut it in half what happens. Um, some of you said, let's look at the extreme, extreme values. So that gives kids an opportunity to kind of jump in wherever they are and then you can hopefully push them forward. Also the idea of if you um, leave it more open-ended, they get an opportunity to construct their own viable arguments and critique the reasonings of others depending on how they're comparing their models um, using mathematical models. And um, I, I really like to think about this precision too because this attending to precision um, oftentimes oops, Oftentimes it's thought of in terms of numerical precision, but if you look at the standard, it really talks about precision in terms of, of mathematical language, too. So we can use the mathematical language of domain and range in context. We can talk specifically about how you're going to define your variables and how you're going to write the area function in terms of that variable. You know, the, the more the kids have an opportunity to express themselves and communicate their ideas, with that precision, the better off I think they are. So I think it's a nice problem in terms of mathematical practices. Um, here are some resources for teachers. Um, I actually gave a talk at the Teaching Contemporary Mathematics Conference in 2009, which is a conference we have here at North Carolina School of Science and Math. It happens at the end of January usually. And um, the handout for the hands-on optimization talk that I gave is available at that TCM website. If you just do a Google search on NCSSM TCM, you can see um, my materials from that, because you can go to the 2009 year, you can see my materials from that hands-on optimization talk. And I did this problem, and I had three other problems. 
um, that you might want to go look at, especially if you are doing optimization problems in, um, in pre-calculus or calculus. The other problems, I think, are a little bit more challenging because one of them is um, one of them is a three-dimensional problem that you have to think about a vertical cross-section. So, but you can go look at them and see if, if there are things there that you might want to use. Also, we have created um, lessons, complete lessons with a classroom-ready handout and a handout that um, is for the teachers for various topics in Algebra 2 and advanced functions and modeling. So if you go to either one of those websites, then um, you can see those materials there, and they're divided up by topics. So if you're studying exponential functions and you're looking for a data problem with exponential functions or linear functions, et cetera, um, across those different courses, you might be able to find something that's very useful. One resource that I did not list here um, that, I, that I've just been exploring recently is are the NCTM core math tools. So if you go to the NCTM website and you pull down the core math tools, those are the Java applet, I believe, that you can pull down onto your machine and it has lots of data sets in it and some um, different kinds of tools. And I've just started exploring those, but they, I found them to be very useful. I've also put my email address down, down there at the bottom. Um, so like I said, if you create a GeoGebra file or you use this and you have questions or comments, or if um, you know, you have some other problems that you want to share, please feel free to send me those via email and we'll post them and I'll um, make sure and give you credit for those. Um, in terms of these sessions, we haven't set the, the dates for these yet. They're still up in the air. Um, so we're thinking about the late March, March 25th, and then the late April session, April the 22nd, that'd be after the NCTM meeting. Um, and this week's materials will be posted at that website. I'm, I found a couple of typos as I've been talking in the PowerPoint, so I'll fix those and send that right to Carol, and she'll post that um, PowerPoint along with all the other supporting materials and the um, archived version of the webinar because she's been recording the webinar. 